Go with me all the way back to Genesis, and let's track back and see when we first begin to see a pattern of, and the Lord was with him. We would see it earlier in the patriarchs with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but it says it one time after another with Joseph starting in Genesis 39. Why this is such a perfect text to look at is because it's such varied circumstances and yet it keeps saying the same phrase. Genesis 39, I'm going to do one and two because we're heading to two and because we just may as well. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt because, ladies, his brothers had sold him into slavery, put blood on his clothes, taken them to his dad, and said he has been torn up, implied to him that he had been killed by wild animals. You talk about meanness. They tried to leave him for dead, and some of the brothers were like, no, 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 let's at least leave him alive. We'll just like sell him into this caravan. And so they took him to Egypt finds himself there. Watch what happens. It says, Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. Verse 2, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and it says that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands, and Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. So I mean, it's like, boy, first glimpse of it is, I'm going to tell you something. If the Lord is with me, the way it will show is that I am going to be successful. And so when you see somebody successful out there, we would just think, well, then the Lord must be with them. The richer they are, the more successful they are, the more the Lord must be with them. Only that is not how the narrative goes at all. Because in those circumstances, I mean, he had success in what he had been, carefully, carefully listen, sold into slavery to do. But then it all goes awry because Potiphar's wife is looking to have sex with him. Keeps trying, keeps trying, keeps trying. Gets so frustrated because he will not agree to. That he runs from her. She pulls his garment, lays it on the bed beside her for her husband to see and says, this is what he has done to him. Well, needless to say, he's thrown in prison. That's when we see Genesis 39 that now says this in verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison, verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The man prospered because the Lord was with him. Verse 23 says, the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. It's the craziest thing because it's not circumstantial. It's that no matter what situation he was in because the Lord was with him, he could do what he couldn't. Is anybody getting the concept with me? Because when the Lord is with you, somehow, in some way, you can do something you can't. I can tell you this, you cannot, you cannot, you absolutely cannot fulfill your calling. You do not have it in you. You do not have what it takes. The only one who can fulfill your calling is Jesus. And he does it by way of his spirit through you, his spirit through you. And that's why if we quench him for decades on end, we could get to the end of our lives and go, you know what? He promised me that he would use me. And he never did because we quenched him and quenched him and quenched him and quenched him. He said, you know what? You only ever did what you could do because you never let me fill you enough to team over and anoint you where we could do what you couldn't do. Because the only way people can see Jesus in you is when you do what you can't. When you have joy, when your life is miserable, 
when you are the one at work that doesn't talk about everybody, when you don't stab everybody in the back, when you're still generous, when you feel like you can barely make ends meet, these are things you cannot do. These are things the Holy Spirit does through you. And that is when the handprint of God shows up when the hand of God is upon you. Now let's contrast Moses, the servant of the Lord. Everybody turn to Exodus 3. By this time, there is no Pharaoh who remembers anything whatsoever about Joseph and Joseph's family that had all found deliverance in a famine there in Egypt. And yet all the Israelites are still there and they've been made into slaves and they are terribly oppressed under a very wicked Pharaoh. And it says the Lord heard the cries of the people who were oppressed and came to deliver them. And if you'll pick up with me in Exodus 3, I want to start reading at verse Four, let's see what it says. It says then, this is the, when he's on the far side of the desert. And he goes over to look because there is a bush that has caught fire. And it's not so unusual that a bush would catch fire. What was unusual is that the fire would not consume the bush. It just kept burning without burning up. What it had lit... And it says in verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out to him from out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come up to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians Egyptians oppress them. Come, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring up my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, But I will be with you. I am Emmanuel, the with you God. I will never, ever forsake you. And this will be the sign for you, for I've sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt and you shall serve God on this mountain. So he goes into all of this. Moses says, well, who am I supposed to tell him is even sending me? This is what he says, you tell them I am. I am who I am. That's who is sending you. And then he tells Moses, listen, I'm going to do all of this for you. I'm going to cause all these signs. I'm going to cause all these wonders. Would you then go with me to Exodus 4, 10 through 15? But Moses said to the Lord, oh, Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. You've got to appreciate that because he's going, you know what, I'm no better than I was when I met you a few minutes ago is the thing. <laughs> I couldn't speak before I met you. I can't speak now. I can't, so I, you know, and so the Lord says, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or, or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth. I don't know if that's good, good news to anybody else. <laughs> And I will teach you what you shall speak. And he says, verse 13, oh Lord, please send someone else. <laughs> and then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well, and he's coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he's going to be glad to see you, and you will speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with his mouth, and I will teach you both what to do. Moses is like, you're not enough. I'm going, to need, I'm, going to, I'm going to need somebody else. So he gives him Aaron. Now, Aaron, God works sovereignly through Aaron. He, he already knows he's going to use Aaron to be the lineage of the great high priest. I mean, this is, this is important. 
But I also want to remind you that this is the same guy when Moses was up on the mountain of God receiving the commandments that he was down there going, man, the time is getting late. (laughs) And so Moses is coming down the mountain with the tablets in his hand going like, what? I hear dancing and singing. What is that? Gets down there and he goes, Aaron, what have you done? And I'm going to put it in a nutshell, but you can see it for yourself because it's nearly word for word. He says, it's the strangest thing. Like We took all these gold earrings, we threw them into a fire and out jumped a golden calf. <laughs> it's crazy. You cannot believe what happened. What could we do but worship it? When we demand human witness, where divine witness belongs, the results can be perilous. When that space, which is for his witness, I insist upon somebody else being in, it's going to get disastrous. The last couple of years have been challenging for all of us. As events were canceled one after another, our entire ministry moved online. But the mission at Living Proof Ministries did not change. In fact, by the grace of God, we were able to reach more people through our online platforms than ever before. Our passion is to see people come to know and love Jesus through the study of Scripture. We accomplish this through our weekly TV program and YouTube channel, our nationwide live events, and our local ministry prayer hour. We also published a new Bible study complete with both a physical workbook and a digital dashboard format. Our ministry has had a front row seat to God's faithfulness as He provided financially through so many of you. Please allow me to say thank you. As we look ahead, we want to remain open-handed to new opportunities that the Lord could bring our way. Would you consider partnering with us through a first-time financial gift or supporting our ministry monthly? We would be so grateful. Thank you for your support and prayers. Living Proof Ministries is so pleased to partner with the Voice of the Martyrs as they teach us how to come alongside our persecuted brothers and sisters who serve Jesus in areas of the world closed to the gospel. I love the Voice of the Martyrs' core ministry verse. It's out of Hebrews 13. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. Part of the Voice of the Martyrs' mission is to call the body of Christ to remember our persecuted Christian family members by fervently praying and providing support for them. Today, as a blessing to you, the Voice of the Martyrs will send you a free copy of their book, Hearts of Fire, when you visit their website. You will be impacted by eight women in the underground church and their stories of costly faith. Would you join me in linking arms with the Voice of the Martyrs to further the gospel? We would be so grateful. We believe that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. That Jesus Christ came in the flesh to seek and to save the lost. And we have come to testify that this Jesus still transforms lives, still sets captives free, heals the brokenhearted, defends the oppressed, revives the souls of the weary, and renews our anxious minds. You and I have been called to freedom. In a world inundated with bad news, there's good news. Discover hope and joy in the scriptures. Come and find community. And worship the King. Experience generations of women opening the Word of God. Come with us to Living Proof Live. Join us in a city near you. I remember many, many, many years ago learning an uh, an acronym of the word Easter, and it said, Every Alternative Savior Takes Early Retirement. And I have never forgotten it. In other words, you want a relationship to go awry, you just make a false Christ out of them. Because you do not have another Savior but Jesus. There is no other name that saves. There are helpers in our lives. There are rich friendships. Romantic love. But that space in our lives 
where he said, when I am with you, I can enable you to be who you are not, to do what you can't, and to be who you aren't. And when anybody else gets in there, we never even know what that's like. Moses, but I will be with you. We get in this disastrous, big codependent situation, and he said, but I, I told you I would be with you. But I thought he was going to be my savior. No, I told you I would be with you. I thought if he hired me and I just worked at that church or I worked at that ministry. No, no, it wasn't them. I told you I would be with you. They don't have what you needed. They weren't your savior. They couldn't give you that ministry. I was the one who was with you. I want you to see something where the name Emmanuel first originates on the page in that spelling in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah because its context is absolutely fascinating. Turn with you to a couple of last scriptures. I want you to see Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, that son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Aramayim, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. So Isaiah is the prophet of God at this time, one of them. He's a prophet of God at this time. King Ahaz um, is a, an, a foolish and evil king over Judah. And so two peoples, the Syrians and then the Ephraimites, uh, who are were God's people, had come together in, into an alliance to come against King Ahaz and the people of Jerusalem. So he is totally freaking out. So God tells the prophet Isaiah, go to him, go out and meet Ahaz, you and your sons, and say to him, and I'm in verse 4, be careful, be quiet, do not fear and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. He says, because they have devised evil against you and said, let us go up to Judah and take it. And it says in verse 7, thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. That's saying all this because he's saying, do you see that these are all people led by people? And you're intimidated by these stumps of firebrands? And he says, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Those words in the second half of verse 9 are so powerful. And again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask for a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as shale or as high as heaven. Do you know what God is saying? Ask me for a sign. Ask me for a sign. You talk about mercy and grace? This guy was an idiot. And God's going, listen, you don't need to be scared of them because I have put my name on that place. Ask me for a sign. Well, he won't. He will not do it. Ahaz says in verse 12, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear them, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary man that you would weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now stay with me here and let me tell you something because the context of it is absolutely perfect. Because he's saying, listen, when I am with you, you do not need an alliance with any powerful man. I am the Lord your God, and I have promised to be with you. This is the significance of the with us God. And so I started thinking about something. That the really peculiar thing about the culture we're presently living in is that our temptation has even surpassed 
putting warm flesh and blood in the place of God. That used to be us. Now, we're putting technology, cold as ice, in the place of the human that we used to put in the place of God. So now, technology, not even warm flesh and blood, technology is now in the space where the with us of God would have borne witness in our lives. Now, so here, here's what I did. I thought, what an odd thing. I thought what an odd thing it was. And so I, I jotted down a little rewrite to make the point of the 23rd Psalm. The phone is my shepherd. I shall not want. It maketh me to lie down in bed and check my notifications. It leadeth me into isolation. It addicteth my soul. It leadeth me in the paths of social media for my name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of Christ's abundant life, I shall not know it. For thou, O phone, art with me. Thy charger and thy earbuds, they comfort me. <laughs> thou sittest with me at the table in the presence of my family. Thou anointest my head with anxiety. My cell bill runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, but I shall surely not know it. For I will dwell with my face in my phone for all of my days. One of my very favorite of all occurrences that speaks of the withness of God happens right at the end of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is written by the Apostle Paul, and one thing that makes it so extravagantly unique is that it is the last thing he writes before he gives his neck to the sword. So, I mean, we're at the last, the very end of it, where his pen is about to go dry. This profuse pen that has written all of these letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Galatians, all of Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and on and on. And it's about to go bone dry, and he is about to be in the presence of the Lord. So he tells Timothy something, because he's, been, he's in prison, not Timothy, but Paul himself, he's in prison, been through all manner of things, beaten, nearly dead, over and over again. In my first defense, no one stood by me, but everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the proclamation might be fully made through me and all the Gentiles might hear. And so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The reason why you're on the planet probably is on the other side of you finding out what it's like for no one to come through for you. How do you know what he could be to you if you are never alone enough with him to find out? This is what happens on the other side of this kind of moment. I'm going to tell you something. I struggle with doubts about a lot of things. Whether or not Jesus Christ is real and is more than my imaginary friend is not one of them. I have lived through things that are absolutely outrageous. That I am positive that the woman I knew at 20 could not possibly get through and be able to collect three thoughts that made any sense. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Things that should have, should anybody besides me be dead? Just like, I mean, I'm going to tell you something in a different, I'm, if not for Jesus, I should, I, flat, I should be dead. I should be dead. I, I'm, him I know. I, I don't know him like I want to know him. But I can tell you this, I know the one in whom I believe is what Paul said. And I am convinced that he is able. Yeah. 
to protect what has been entrusted to me until that day. Would you look back with me? And let's conclude in Matthew 1, 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. How precious that God would send his son to be born of a young woman. holding this tiny little infant in her arms that God would so esteem warm flesh and blood that he would wrap his own baby in it. Thank you so much for watching today. Man, it is our joy to serve you at Living Proof Ministries. We do not take a single one of you for granted. Click subscribe so that you don't miss a moment of our time together in Scripture. We'll see you back on the channel very soon.